Do you want to know how to get back into running after childbirth? We are talking about postpartum running with an expert who has done it herself personally two times and now helps women overcome this common fear and problem. Welcome to episode 123 on the Healthy Runner podcast, where we help you get stronger, run faster, and enjoy lifelong injury-free running. And today we have a very special guest with us today. We have Dr. Amanda Olson, who is a mother of two boys, a runner, a physical therapist, a pelvic floor specialist, um, running coach, Pilates instructor, author. She's like, does it all. Um, but also is the chief clinical officer and president of the company Intimate Rose, where she develops pelvic health products and education um, to help our mother runners out there. Um, she's very passionate about empowering women and men with pelvic health issues, including pelvic pain, incontinence, pregnancy, and postpartum issues. Um, Dr. Olson teaches internationally on various pelvic health topics, including pelvic floor dysfunction in runners. Um, she has written peer-reviewed articles, as well as newspaper and magazine articles on pelvic floor dysfunction and running, and also authored the book, Restoring the Pelvic Floor for Women. So thank you so much for accepting my invite to come on the show, Amanda. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, this is going to be great. And I know this is, this is something that a lot of mom runners... Um, often ask questions um, to a lot of our healthy runner coaches. And I have a feeling there's going to be a lot of mother runners out there that probably learn a little something today and maybe identify some issues that, you know, either they didn't know they were having, or they didn't realize there were some simple solutions um, to some of these things. So in this episode, guys, we're going to really kind of chat about um, some of these struggles um, that moms will face or any questions that you have after becoming a mother, right? So we're going to get into like, is it safe to run um, even before childbirth? Is it safe to run during pregnancy? Because I know that's a, a common you know question that comes up. We're going to also talk about like, when is the best time to start running after giving birth? You know, what exercises are best for running after giving birth? Um, is it painful to run um, after giving birth? How soon can you go for a run with your baby? Um, how long will it take to regain your running fitness after baby? And then, you know, what about kind of pumping, feeding, um, all of those questions? Is it, you know, can you go for a run um, while breastfeeding? And we're going to get into all that. So on the show, Amanda, we always start out with a little dynamic warm up, right? We know how important that is. And our dynamic warm up here is really. I shared your formal bio, but, you know, can you share with us kind of your backstory on how you got to where you are in your career, you know, starting out as maybe a little, you know, running backstory as well as your professional backstory? Absolutely. I have been a runner, honestly, as long as I can remember, probably since age 10, I am from Oregon and running is, um, bread and water here. <laughs> so I actually, I'm from Portland, but I went to middle school and high school in Eugene and Eugene is Trek city. So it's just part of the culture. Even if you were playing other sports, which I did, um, running is just part of the way. So you'd be going for a little trot on weekends. And then, um, I was a collegiate athlete and became more of a distance runner after graduating and going to PT school to do my doctorate as a means of stress relief. And it just brings me so much joy. So uh, running has just been a part of me for as long as I can remember. Um, and then in physical therapy, I actually expressly went to physical therapy school and did my doctoral dissertation in the field of pediatrics. I had intended to specialize in peds and then um, came out in about a year into my practice, I significantly injured my tailbone and caused great injury to my entire pelvic floor prior to even becoming pregnant or becoming a mother. And wow. as a, yeah, yeah, it was a whole, it was a whole big injury. And so um, my gynecologist at the time had the wherewithal to refer me to a pelvic health colleague in physical therapy. And I had to go to expensive pelvic floor rehab and she fixed me right up and changed my life. And, um, I went on to have two boys naturally and run marathons and do all the things I want to do. But at the end of my treatment, she told me you need to quit pediatrics and do pelvic health. You have the right personality for it. And there's a huge need. There's not enough. And this was 14 years ago. And at the time there was roughly like 300 in the country. And now we have 
thousands. So pelvic health in physical therapy has been around for 40 years, but it's been a very small area and now it's growing bigger and bigger and there's more awareness and we actually treat all people. So we treat males, females, we treat people who have given birth, people who have not given birth, um, all different types of pelvic health issues, ranging from pelvic pain to incontinence and constipation, fecal issues. So we do all the things um, in that area. And then my specific area of love was merging the two together between running and pelvic health. And there's been a growing body of evidence to help us guide our treatments and how we manage people in that area. So that's kind of where, where I am now. And then I have uh, intimate rows where I create devices that just empower people to help manage their pelvic health issues on their own outside of a clinical environment. Oh, I love it. I love how you took your passion for both of those things, right. That, you know, you had a personal connection to, right. Like you, you said, you started out running early in life. Um, I think you might be the first guest on the show ever from Oregon. Um, uh-huh. I think, uh, yeah, I don't think we've ever had one yet. So you are the first, um, and I didn't realize that running is like the thing, huh? To do there. Yeah. That's, yeah. Even if okay. you're not competitive people just, I mean, it's, it's just, you, you know, sure. I, I was, I, you know, I was around people and you just drive down the street and people are just out running of all different body types and backgrounds and ages. And, you know, it's, it's just part of what, what goes on. I love it. I love it. Um, here in Connecticut, we're a pretty active state and I think there are a lot of runners in Connecticut. Um, but yeah, see, I learned something new every day. I'm going to learn a whole lot more today. Um, <laughs> as my, um, experience, you know, in pelvic health PT is very limited in just what I've taught our kind of entry-level DPT students, um, as well as me, you know, throughout my career, utilizing some kind of basic level, right? Pelvic floor exercises. And I understand the importance of the pelvic floor, of course. Um, but this is going to be good because I'm going to get to learn some stuff today as well. And then I guess I should share, you know, how we wound up meeting. Um, I've shared on the uh, podcast before, um, when we had Doug Adams, as well as, uh, Scott Greenberg on the show, um, that I also met Amanda at the same, uh, running, uh, pre-conference course, at our national uh, conference, our APTA national conference for physical therapists. And yeah, I just loved what she had to say as well, uh, just like I did with Doug and Scott. So I knew I had to uh, bring her on the show. So this is a treat for all of you listening um, today. And, you know, one thing that I can ask, honestly, because some of these issues are not often talked about um, in the running community. So if you're a runner right now listening to this um, and you're getting value from Amanda, please like just share it. It's like, like literally click the button, like copy link, send it to another running friend of yours, just so we can help empower more um, runners out there to, to learn about some of these issues and that there is some help that they can get with some of these issues. So that's my only ask for you, the listener today is just to share it with a running friend of yours. Um, but yeah, I love your, uh, kind of background story and how you've even kind of pivoted that as you've gone on to more really treating the masses, if you will. Right. And that's kind of what I essentially have done with my career as well as as opposed to helping just one person one-on-one. Um, now you're able to influence so many women because of the education you're doing for other physical therapists, for the education you do on your amazing Instagram account. Um, and honestly, the products that you create, um, for, many, many women out there and males included, right. Um, that can help with some of those, um, issues. So, yeah, I just love that you've kind of, you know, grown and developed in your career professionally to not only help one, but help many. Um, so I just love, love seeing that and utilizing those talents and skills, um, that you have. So, yeah, I guess the first question I have for you is kind of before childbirth. I know this episode is really about childbirth, but it is a common question we get. And I think there's some misconceptions probably out there in, um, our running culture and, or medical profession. Um, is it actually safe to run while pregnant? That is a great question. And we can't have, we, we, 
definitely can't talk about postpartum without talking about the pregnancy. So um, the, the safety of running during pregnancy is first deemed by the birth provider. So the um, obstetrician or midwife um, is going to be checking to ensure that the implantation is good and healthy and safe and that the cervix is doing its job and that it's healthy. And um, in most cases, that is the case. Um, there are certainly different instances where it's not and the birth provider will say your limitations are to do these activities, no impact, no running. Um, but by and large, for most people, they are going to get that green light to exercise as they see fit. And so that green light says, yes, running is safe. And so in their um, overarching guidelines, the ACOG, which is our um, overarching medical body of obstetricians and gynecologists, um, states that the Women can go for a run while they're pregnant as long as they can carry on a few sentences of conversation. So that's currently the litmus test as to the intensity of running or any exercise for that matter. Um, as they're going along as this, you know, if you're if you were talking with a friend on your run, as running groups tend to do, um, can you get out a few sentences or are you so out of breath that you cannot? So they don't want you so out of breath that you couldn't say a few sentences together. All right. So we're keeping to that kind of easy conversational pace, um, exactly. running. So you're not doing any speed work while you're pregnant. Um, as you could go as fast as you want, as long as you can still say okay. a few sentences, okay. <laughs> which at a dead sprint, if you're working in that anaerobic, uh, type uh, workout, then most people cannot. And especially the further in pregnancy you go, your breathing becomes a little bit more challenging to considerably more challenging. And I would imagine, is that just because as we, um, you know, work harder, like if we were to run faster and we're not able to get out those couple of sentences, our heart rate is kind of increasing. And then is that potentially decreasing blood flow to the baby? Is that what? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. They're, they're looking at, it's a couple of factors of temperature to the baby and, um, overall, um, airway to the baby and airway to mom as well. So, um, they, you know, they used to go off of heart rate. They used to go off of overall body temperature as a means of checking the healthiness. And now they've just gone to the talk test is what they're referring to it. But yeah, all of those are really important. That's why moms who are pregnant can't get in the hot tub. They just, we don't want to, I, I teasingly say, we don't want to bake the baby. So you want to yep. keep your overall body temperature healthy to the point where we're not overheating the baby and causing potential harm to them. Okay. That makes sense. And so kind of the summarize there is, um, before birth, uh, it's really kind of dependent upon that individual to kind of talk to their provider, have that conversation. They know their medical history. They know, you know, what variables would be taken into account, but in general, generally speaking, most, um, you know, folks while pregnant are able to actually run. Yep. Yeah. And the, generally speaking, as long as that pregnancy um, continues to get that green light on those follow-up appointments with their gynecologist or their uh, midwife, they can continue to run as long as they want. A lot of women will become uncomfortable um, and running is no longer feeling good on their body as the pregnancy progresses. But um, it's, it's just at that point, what's feeling good to them, what's bringing them joy and what is continuing to be safe for their particular pregnancy. But that's why it's, if someone is feeling good, they can run as late into that pregnancy as they want, as long as they're following those safety guidelines. Okay. Thank you for that clarification. And all right. So now let's go babies here, right? It's like the most joyous occasion ever. Like I think about those two days that both of my daughters were born, right? It's like those special days you never forget. Um, it's just like locked in, right? Your mind and, you know, just again, like top five day, right? In your life, like, yeah, like your wedding day, right? You're like the birth of your kids. Um, so that day comes and now, you know, baby's out. And, you know, when is the best time, you know, if mom is, you know, wants to get out there and start running, when is the best time to start running after giving birth? Sure. <laughs> Sorry. My allergies are acting up a little. Mm. Oh, allergies are terrible. Um, yes. yeah, it's, it's starting tis the season, um, <laughs> which makes it tough, especially for us, uh, early morning runners when the pollen count is a little higher. Um, it's not, not the best. Absolutely. So the return to run is 
gray area and it's highly, highly variable. So there's no hard and fast date, which is contrary to the six week follow up appointment that all women know that happens after delivery of the baby. So, um, so baby is delivered six weeks. Generally speaking, the obstetrician wants to see them back in the clinic for a follow up appointment. And those appointments may not include a complete uh, evaluation. Their pelvic floor is generally not assessed, but generally they're checking in to see if they're okay. And then they're giving them the green light to do whatever they want. And that may include returning to intercourse, go exercise as you please. And what we're, what we're doing in pelvic health physical therapy is spreading awareness that that is the perfect time frame to get an evaluation to come and see a pelvic health physical therapist for a complete evaluation of their entire body, really, and particularly the pelvic floor, because we're interested in the condition of their spine and their pelvis and their hips and their pelvic floor muscles after that pregnancy and to be providing them with one-on-one -on -one guidance and care to ensure that they can return to all of those activities, including running during that time. In other countries, including France, it is, it is the way to provide them with 12 visits of pelvic health physical therapy after delivery. That is just part of their health system there. And we are working on that here in the United States. Um, but all of those factors, including the feet and the hips and all of, of all of those structures I described are important in determining someone's readiness. Um, so in that way, I advocate for asking for the evaluation to go to a public health physical therapist. And if, if listeners are later in that journey, any, at any point, you can request an evaluation for the pelvic floor. You don't have to have recently given birth and you don't have to have given birth at all. You can request if you are having these issues, request a referral, insurance is accepted in most clinics and hospital systems and come and see us for an evaluation if you're experiencing leakage or pain or pressure with running. Um, so that's why the variable time is so different. Um, birth and pregnancy in itself is highly variable. Somebody may have had a lot of complications during their pregnancy. They may have had a very complicated or even traumatic delivery. They may have had a C-section. They may have had vaginal delivery and experienced a tear or episiotomy, which are injuries to the pelvic floor. And so when you look at all of the things that happen to the tendons and ligaments and muscles, it's not unlike having an ACL repair. And in ACL repair, we have a very strategic plan of rehabilitation to ensure that all of those structures are healing properly and to re-strengthen the muscles and to retrain someone how to move their body and how to have good timing and coordination and control on their run. And all of those things apply to the pelvis and the pelvic floor after delivery. So um, the tissue healing generally takes six to eight weeks if you've experienced a tear. And that's why that six week green light may not be appropriate. They may not be fully healed in that way. Um, and then additionally, other factors on top of that, such as fatigue and nutrition status and dehydration all come into play as to um, not just if they're ready, but how well that return to run is going to go. And that's where having that guidance is really, really helpful as well. So the timeline could be anywhere from five weeks to three, four, six months in a newly postpartum person. Um, and that's why having that evaluation is really helpful so that we can put you on a plan to help re-strengthen the pelvic floor muscles, address any scar tissue, including that C-section scar, assess the feet. The feet go through a tremendous amount of change during pregnancy. Sometimes the foot is a uh, half size to a size larger, and those little muscles in between the bones need to be re-strengthened and re-taught how to be dynamic and coordinated and strong as part of that process. So, um, that's, that's why it's such a gray area. Yeah, no, that makes sense. And so there's not a specific six weeks you're cleared for return to run or eight weeks, 10 weeks, whatever the case may be. Um, it is really dependent upon that individual. And I like that you brought up, you know, taking a look at the whole body, right? And it's not 
And that's where physical therapists specialize in, right? And it's not just, you know, being able to go to your OB, um, but looking at the whole body, especially if you're looking to get back into running and things change dramatically, right? The body changes during pregnancy. I know you alluded to the feet and, you know, usually they're going to splay out a little bit more. And I like that you talked about kind of activating those deep foot muscles. We actually just had an episode, um, probably six episodes ago with, Dr. Emily Splickle, um, who is a functional podiatrist and movement specialist, she shared some great tips and kind of activating um, some of those deep foot muscles and the importance of that for running. And definitely for someone after um, pregnancy, you know, it's going to be really important um, for that. And I love that, you know, thank you for mentioning um, being our own advocates, right? And if you're a runner out there listening to this right now, and you just had a baby and, you know, you do need to have these conversations with your doctor. And I, I don't have a lot of experience dealing with OBs, but obviously you do. Um, some medical fields may have the, um, thought process of, oh, you don't need to do that. Or, you know, they're, and or don't understand the demands of running, quite frankly, right? Let's be honest, um, where they'll tell patients like, oh, you don't need to do that. Just start running. Just go slow. Just, you know, give it a whirl and see how it goes. And um, if someone, if someone's OB did say that, I'm not sure if that's common in, in your field. Um, is there another way that they can, is there a resource that they can find a pelvic health PT near them? Absolutely. Um, So all of the above are true. What I have observed in doing this in the last 14 years is the new generation of physicians, I'm going to, I'm going to say 45 and below are so collaborative with pelvic health PT. I think the medical training has changed a lot. And the, this new generation of physicians, whether they are gynecology, urology, general care, primary care, they are they are so collaborative and so positive and so supportive, and they're very apt to put that referral in. And some of them are just doing it. And so we are seeing a lot of amazing headway there. I'm not trying to pigeonhole the older generation. Some of them are amazing and have learned and are collaborating really well with public health and physical therapy, but some of them may have not come to that point in their journey in medicine yet. So for that reason, if you are experiencing trouble getting that referral from a Uh, specialty area, whether it's gynecology or um, obstetrics, ask your primary care physician, ask your nurse practitioner, all of them have those prescriptive rights. And many states also have what's called open door access, which we have here in Oregon, where you can see a physical therapist of any uh, background and specialty for 30 days without a referral. Um, that is dependent on your insurance, but um, that does allow you to come in and get the evaluation. And then we can determine if you need follow-up care beyond that month time. And then we can advocate on your behalf to your physician. We can provide them with your measurements, with the evaluation um, outcomes that we see and the goals that we have for you. And we can work with that physician. And sometimes that's a great way to educate a physician on what we do. So um, there's a lot of different ways for every person who's present. There's a lot of different ways to get care. And you can find a pelvic health physical therapist in your area on a lot of different search engines. Um, If you email our support team, support at Intimate Rose, we will get your zip code and connect you with somebody in our database that has pelvic health um, background. So that's a service that we offer here. Um, And then Herman and Wallace Pelvic Health Institute has a search um, capability as well, where you can enter in your zip code and find providers in your area. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Um, So I'm sure this next question is going to obviously depend, but I guess generally speaking, um, what muscles or what exercises really are best um, for running after giving uh, birth? Yeah. So interestingly enough, whole body, like strategically targeting even the scapular muscles in the shoulder. And of course the core and the pelvic floor, and then the hip muscles and the feet, which kind of sounds like everything, 
But all of those are really important because of the changes that happen in pregnancy. So during pregnancy, our shoulder blades roll forward a little bit as a natural byproduct of tissue growing and the baby's pulling forward. So we have to accommodate so we don't fall down. <laughs> and some people do. <laughs> um, but because of the nature of the changes to the pelvis too, targeting the, the hips and the rotators of the hips and then the pelvic floor itself and then the heat, the, you know, the hamstrings and the feet muscles. So targeting all the entire body and starting in a very, um, closed, quiet environment that allows you to learn how to re-isolate. When I say learn things happen with changes in our body during pregnancy and childbirth that can make us, um, temporarily lose the coordination and the timing and control of those muscles. Um, in some ways it is like riding a bicycle in some ways it's not where our brain forgets how to turn a muscle on very quickly. And we know that we need that not just in our tasks during the day to day, but especially with running where we're thinking about the turnover of our stride and then accepting 2.2 to three times our body weight with every step. And that's why it's not just a green light go for running. Um, we want to make sure that our body is in a place where we can mitigate all of that force that's coming through there. And it's not that you're broken. It's just that you need to retune and retime some of those muscle coordinations and attend to any injuries that may have occurred. Some people are experiencing deep and profound pelvic girdle pain and low back pain after pregnancy and pelvic floor muscle function contributes towards getting rid of that pain. So the pelvic floor muscles, the diaphragm, the abdominals, and the back muscles all work together kind of like a chorus to ensure that we have good trunk control and also to ensure that we don't leak urine and that we're breathing properly and that we can bend over and get that heavy car seat out of the car. And then also to then go and experience that, that heavy weight of uh, 2.2 to three times our body weight with each step when we're running. Yeah, it makes sense. And oh my goodness, those carriers, like I, it's been, uh, let's see, my, uh, youngest is 12 years old. So what it's been like 12 years since I had to lift one of those things, but I was like, dude, man, these things are heavy <laughs> Especially so when the heavy. babies in there and then yes. they're growing. They're good. You're like yes. happy. They're gaining weight every time you take them to the doctors. And then it's like, holy cow, this is heavy. Um, yeah. Moms need to be super strong. That's for sure. Absolutely. Um, and I like that you really um, highlighted like the surrounding muscles and thinking core. So if you're listening to this and you haven't um, done deeper core exercises before, really, that's what Amanda is talking about is like teaching your deeper core. So if, you know, you're, let's say you're six weeks out and your OB was like, okay, start exercises. Like these aren't you hopping on the ground and doing crunches or doing sit-ups, right? So what Amanda is talking about is actually getting the muscles deeper than that, like six pack muscle, right? Your rectus, um, activated and teach it how to work and use it with the other surrounding hip muscles that help stabilize when we are running on one leg, um, that Amanda's alluding to. So just think about, you know, if you've been a person who's traditionally thought of the core as like your sit-ups and your crunches and your like thousand leg lifts, um, it's actually counterproductive and can do, from my understanding, um, some harm, especially while things are still healing. And it, it probably will lead to further inactivation and not being able to activate the correct muscles that we need um, to get back into running um, after pregnancy. Would you agree with that? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And that's why we do um, a gradual, gentle progression at the same time, too starting to dose you with some running so that you can be getting back out there. In the meanwhile, we may do something else for your cardiovascular health to work up so that your heart and lungs are ready to show up for you when you're ready to show up for that first run. Um, but yes, certainly targeting all of the muscle groups and timing the pelvic floor to contract. So training it. A pelvic floor contraction is also referred to as a Kegel. And it's so funny culturally kegels are under some weird sort of pr <laughs> nightmare <laughs> 
um, where people are vastly misunderstanding what a Kegel actually is. Um, a Kegel at the end of the day was named after Dr. Arnold Kegel in the 50s, and it's just a contraction of the pelvic floor muscles. So similarly to, again, going back to that ACL tear, if you did that, we would need to re-strengthen your quadricep muscles and not just train them in strength, but also endurance. And again, in timing and coordination to think about on off when we go through the running cycle, the same is true of the pelvic floor muscles. There are appropriate doses if they are deemed to be weak. And oftentimes they do have poor endurance. Um, we know that deep core muscles in the abdominals are really fatigable after being pregnant. And we want to be training them as you touched on, not just the pretty muscles in the front, but the deep core muscles in all of those different functions of strength so that you've got good control and core and you're not starting to experience um, issues down the chain as a byproduct of having a core that is not strong and under good endurance. So that would speak to having later on some maybe IT band issues. If you're having fatigable hip muscles, the hip muscles are sharing a tent wall. So a fascial plane with the pelvic floor muscles, they are a team and they want to work together. So we can be training the pelvic floor and the hips at the same time. So some, I know people want to hear what exercises, there are some specific exercises and I do recommend seeing a pelvic health PT, but bridges, single leg bridges, bird dog, Clamshells. Clamshells are also under bad PR right now. <laughs> people, people get grumpy about clamshells, but the nature of using the hip rotator muscles, there's other fun things to do too. Um, but that is one way to just at least start the process of getting the muscle to listen to your brain and start to turn on and get some endurance under it. And then working into the kneeling position and then into standing position. And then finally getting really ballistic and biometric and getting into some hopping and bouncing and skipping and then bounding and then jumping and running. Oh, I love it. And it, a lot of it honestly sounds like, you know, the components that, you know, I kind of designed in our like healthy runner strength program for getting over the common injuries such as IT band pain, runner's knee, right? Chin splints, um, all those common culprits because you are focusing on similar principles I would say definitely making sure the pelvic floor in terms of strength, endurance, timing is working well in conjunction to those other exercises that you mentioned. And yeah, I, I know it's, it's weird, right? It, as far as certain exercises getting a bad rap and, you know, it, I think, you know, people just want to get on a high horse about like a certain exercise and I'm more of the belief of it sounds like similar to you in that we need to teach our bodies first how to use the muscle and activate it correctly before we can use it for strength. Um, so that's why like we have a like restorative program phase of our program um, that teaches you how to activate. And sometimes it requires like different types of cueing, verbal cueing, tactile cueing. And like I was actually just on with a client um, just before we got on and it was literally like teaching her how to contract her glute need, right? The side hip muscle for those listening um, in single leg stance. And she wasn't able to actually control it and know where that muscle was, how to activate it. She was all using quads. Um, so it is kind of really teaching your brain how to activate these muscles. And then you can progress to things that look cooler and, or add load and add, you know, progressive strength and um, all of that. So I, I, I think we sit in similar camps in that it's not like just the quote unquote simple exercises and it's not just the compound movements and lift heavy. Um, you need to see where you're at in your running journey and your um, strength in general. Like, have you been someone who's been strength training for decades? Um, and then are you recovering from a, you know, childbirth scenario? Did you have complications, right? Like there's so many variables. Do you have a history of IT band pain um, before, you know, you wound up getting pregnant? So there's all these variables that are going to, um, you know, play a role. And that's why, you know, reaching out for help, um, as Amanda alluded to, can be super, super beneficial for you and really kind of getting back into your, you know, running regimen. And, you know, before we kind of go any further there, um, 
I guess, you know, this can be a common question or, you know, moms might be wondering or they might be fearful of starting to run. Um, is it painful to go for like a run after giving birth? Yeah, roughly 35% of postpartum women report pain um, when they return to run after being pregnant. So I will say it is common. It's not normal. And that's certainly not something we want you trying to push through. And we, it is a very fixable situation and we will get you back to running. It's not the end of your running career. I think um, being a runner myself, I always like to tell runners, I'm not I'm not going to take your running away unless we have really good sound reason. And we're going to get you back there as quickly as possible, but we have to follow these particular steps to ensure that it's healthy and that you don't land back in my office, though. I love my patients. My goal is to get them independent. So with regards to pain, they could be experiencing pain in the SI joint, pain in the pubic bone. So in the front kind of near the groin, and it can also be deep within the within the pelvis itself, where they, they cannot reach it, they cannot stretch it, they can't exactly describe where it's coming from, but it's in there. And that's where a really thorough exam comes in. And so after that six week mark, hopefully the gynecologist has evaluated them to ensure that there's nothing more serious at play with regards to placenta and cervix and those important organs. Um, but that's where a pelvic health physical therapist can go in and determine if one of the muscles is possibly too tight or if it has a trigger point or a tender point in it. So the same as you can get a knot in your shoulder and you push on it and it zings up and over your head, people can get a knot in their pelvic floor muscles. I know it sounds nutty, but they are muscles just like everywhere else. And they can be a driver of pain if one side is particularly too tight. And that could speak to how the baby sat while they were pregnant or how they walked when they were pregnant, kind of with that penguin <laughs> shuffle sometimes. And particularly if they ran on it that way. Um, and so that's where we're looking to see if they are in there. And then we treat them very, very gently. This is not a no pain, no gain kind of physical therapy. We use very soft, gentle techniques to treat those tender points in it within the pelvic floor muscles. Um, and we work on retraining the muscles so that they know when to contract versus when to relax so that we can eliminate that pain re-strengthen around that so that the biomechanics of how they're moving are sound and then they can return to run. So yeah, pelvic pain, it can be a driver and then it can also feel like a pressure. So sometimes people will say, this feels very uncomfortable. It's not necessarily pain, but it feels like pressure. And that speaks to what's called pelvic organ prolapse, which can happen after pregnancy. And, um, the odds increase with the more times you are pregnant and the more deliveries that you have. And that is where the pelvic organs, which include the bladder and the uterus and the rectum can sink down into the pelvic bowl and into the vaginal wall and um, produce kind of a bulging sensation. And in some cases, some of those organs can come to the entrance or sometimes out of the vagina, which sounds terrible, but by and large, we can do a lot of good to reduce that and to help them stabilize it again. So we can teach them new breathing patterns. We can address restrictions in the fascia that may be pushing on those organs and train the pelvic floor muscles to better stabilize. And then there are certain devices called pessaries that act very similar to an orthotic in the foot to help just support them that can be placed in to lift the organs back up and removed to be cleaned that allow them to go back out and run again. So a lot of times women stop running because they're having that pressure or maybe because they're leaking urine, um, which we can talk about in a moment, but none of those are hard and fast game changers. As long as they're working with the pelvic health physical therapist, oftentimes with the pessary pelvic health physical therapy will work with a urologist or a urogynecologist to get them properly fitted um, for that pessary. And it's, it can be a total game changer. It can make them comfortable again. So um, if runners are in their, um, you know, postpartum years and postpartum was a long time ago, but they've maybe decreased their mileage or they're afraid to train for a longer race or a more intense race because of that, we can work with you. We can get you back to that state. Um, and physical therapists in the United States are at a cusp where we are getting um, the right and the training to be able to fit those pessaries um, in our clinics. So that's a big new development. But in the meanwhile, we work in conjunction with the medical team. 
Okay. Yeah, no, I, that's good. I did not know that and was not aware of that. In will exercises help prolapse or no, just is the pessary the only, so exercises can help as well. Yes. Okay. Exercises are definitely part of it. And the pessary is only for the later stages. So um, prolapse is graded on a scale, very similar to other injuries um, from zero to four. And so pessary is generally only necessarily needed in grades three and four. So some of those latter ones, and I will say like a lot of young women are using them to run and loving life. So it's not like a, an older person thing. Um, but with the grades one and two, generally we use exercise of breathing patterns and education, and we're very conservative with it. And we can reduce that prolapse by one to two grades just with pelvic floor strengthening, we have some evidence to support that. So a lot of good can be done with very specific exercises to help reduce and eliminate that pressure, pressure sensation. That's good to hear because I think there's going to be many women who listen to this who have probably been told before that the only thing they could do is get surgery on it yeah. and the prolapse. And, you know, they feel like they're again, not in their 60s, 70s, 80s, and they're like, I'm still in my 30s or 40s. Like, this is crazy. This is ridiculous. Like, I can't run. And so it is nice to hear that there are some other options out there um, that don't require uh, an undergoing surgery. Um, so I know you alluded to kind of um, leakage issues with running. How common is that? And is it, um, is it, the same thing as what you just mentioned that it's common, but not normal. Exactly. Common, but not normal. <laughs> See, I'm learning. <laughs> you got it already. That's the motto common, but not normal and fixable. We can okay. fix it. All right. So the report rates for leakage for women in high impact sports ranges from 20 to 80%. And that is reflected across multiple research reports. So not just one. It's so up as high as 80%. And that is um, women that have had babies and women who have not had babies. So some athletes are experiencing urinary incontinence who have not necessarily been pregnant or had a baby. Um, and then certainly the risk does go up after having been pregnant or having a baby. The risk can be a bit higher in vaginal delivery. However, women that have had C-section can also experience it. So it is very common and it is not exactly normal, but it is fixable. So urinary incontinence would be leaking urine, um, particularly when we're talking about running, it's called stress urinary incontinence. So when the body is under exertion, um, that could be with a cough, a sneeze, a laugh, and it could be when going to run, it could be um, at the start of the run, and it could be mile five of the run, they start to experience it when they're more fatigued. And that's where we can do a lot of good in strengthening the pelvic floor, addressing any scar tissue or faulty breathing patterns that are placing undue pressure over the bladder working with them on a bladder plan to ensure that they can empty their bladder before they go for a run, strategically running near places where there is a bathroom, but all the meanwhile, working on strengthening and re-coordinating the pelvic floor muscles so that they don't experience that leakage. And that's where too, you want to see a pelvic health physical therapist who has knowledge in running gait, because sometimes the running gait can be contributing to those leakage occurrences. If they have a very heavy footfall or they have restriction in their feet and they are landing with excessive amounts of force coming up through that chain, that can result in some pelvic floor um, instability and that can result in urinary incontinence. The other side of that coin is sometimes the pelvic floor muscles are too tight. And certainly we know um, in some younger, very um, competitive athletes, they may be experiencing a lot of stress and clenching the pelvic floor muscles as a byproduct of that. And then they lack flexibility. So then they're trying to go and run and the pelvic floor muscles are not allowing for a nice dr gentle drop um, and they're experiencing some gapping around their urethra and leaking as a byproduct of that. So it's not always like a one-to-one -one correlation of pelvic floor muscle weakness to urinary incontinence. And that's why we want to do a proper assessment to determine the exact nature of it. But generally speaking, if you've had a significant injury during birth, we want to be addressing all of those components, the scar tissue, the pelvic floor muscle strength, endurance, and coordination, and making sure that they have good flexibility but also good strength. Okay. 
All right. Thank you for clarifying that. So now let's get into kind of going for a run with your little one, right? Like how, how soon can, you know, moms go for runs with their babies? Well, generally speaking, we want to make sure that they're feeling good on their runs first prior to running with the stroller. Um, Running with a stroller does involve use of the shoulder, of course. We want to make sure that they have good strength in their shoulder um, and that they have a a way of stabilizing the infant in the carrier that is safe for the baby. So we have mom safety and we also have baby safety. Um, So it's important first and foremost to be running with a running stroller. So generally they have a tri-point orientation where there's one stroller in front and two in the back that allows the stroller to be um, stable enough to take some exertion. Um, and that it's easy to steer for mom. And then um, safety of the infant will include having that baby's head stable. So when you think about the baby in the carrier, it's the same as them being in a vehicle. If you hit a curb, the the whipping sensation of, of that impact on the baby can be significant. So generally having them in their car seat and having that click into the stroller is the best case scenario um, because most infants until they're about nine to 12 months can't be placed directly into the stroller because they don't have the head control. So you don't want to be placing them into the regular harness of the carrier until they reach the age requirement listed on the stroller, if that makes sense. So for for newer infants into their car seat and click that into the stroller to stabilize the baby. And then for mom, just ensuring that you're training your shoulder muscles. So great ways to do that include planks where you're getting good scapular stabilization. You can be doing some rows with a band to ensure that you have good shoulder stability because you are going to be pushing. Generally recommend they start with a two-handed push technique just on that first run. Most people can't sustain that for the entire run. So then I'd say try to keep an eye on how long you're on your right side of your hand pushing and then switch to your left, usually a minute on right, a minute on left so that you get good balance between the two arms and shoulders. Um, And then it's really important to be stretching your low back and your hips. So there is some increased demand on those particular structures. You need a little bit more flexibility um, because you're not getting that proper arm swing that will change how your body responds down the chain. Um, So good strength and flexibility in the spine and hips. Okay. Yeah, no, that's super helpful tips there. (laughs) And how long will it take to kind of regain running fitness back after baby? It's going to be the same as any other injury generally. Um, So cardiovascularly, it's probably going to take six to eight weeks to start feeling like yourself again. Um, If you're considering a particular race, it's a good idea to give yourself four months um, to train up to it. If it's the 5k to 10k mark, if it's a half marathon or a marathon distance, I recommend getting 500 healthy miles. This is not necessarily a hard and fast evidence-based statement. I want to just speak more Mm -hmm. as like from a coaching perspective, I like to see 500 healthy miles on board of just being able to go out for a run and feeling good and feeling confident and then starting a traditional pyramid buildup. So um, getting back into some hill training, into some speed work after those 500 healthy miles, um, which should take them a couple of months <laughs> to mm-hmm. be able to work up into. Um, so it is a journey back. Um, putting it into perspective, every pregnancy is different. So I always like to use myself with my first baby. I ran my first half marathon at five months. He was five months old. So that's one of the pictures that I gave to you all to have is um, me with him and he's a little baby. And I just finished my first half marathon, but I was allowed, I was safe and um, given the green light to run throughout my entire pregnancy with that first one. On my second one, I was put on exercise probation immediately because I had, um, I was at high risk with him. So I was not allowed to do any walking or any running or anything with that second kiddo. So my, my next half marathon with him, he was closer to a year because I didn't, I, I didn't have any cardiovascular exercise leading up to that, had him and then 
got, we had the task of rebuilding strength and coordination and endurance and all of that. And it just simply takes longer and lifestyle changes all need to be taken into consideration too, in terms of fatigue. Um, and that's speaking of our muscular fatigue, but also our sleepiness fatigue, <laughs> not getting any sleep is really hard on a training schedule. And then nutrition status is important to ensuring that you're getting enough calories on board to be able to train properly, especially if you're nursing and then also um, being properly hydrated and then being able to fit those runs in with your growing family. Right. Right. Okay. And um, yeah. So essentially from what I heard there is that you are going back into like base training mode. And we talked about yeah. that in episode 105 on the podcast about like, what is base training and what does it look like? So if you want more information on that, check out episode 105, but that's what you have to do is, is get the body ready for the demands of running and or racing in the future. So that makes total sense. And then lastly, really, um, is, you know, if mom is pumping, breastfeeding, um, any special considerations, can you run while breastfeeding? Absolutely. Yes. I always recommend that they try to pump right before, which scheduling can be just very hard. I call it milk management <laughs> when people are trying to be coordinating feeding times and pumping and all that. But generally speaking, in terms of the mom's comfort, it is um, best to try to pump or nurse on both sides right before going for a run or as close to it as possible um, so that you're just, you have less on board and then being sure that you find a good, comfortable sports bra. Um, and then if it's going to be a long run, perhaps you're running with the stroller and running with the infant and having a planned time feeding break, which can be just really fun. It's, it can be just so fun to have your baby around while you're training. But if you're just training without them, um, you might plan to be running near home to where you could stop and take a pump break. Or if it's in your car and you have the freezer ice chest situation of planning ahead of time to just pump at the car, put it in and then go back out. So it does take additional planning, depending on how long you're going to be out. If it's just a 30 to a 60 minute run, you should be okay. Um, depending on what your pump schedule is to pump prior, go out and run and then come back. Yeah. And then last final question I have for you is really, if you could change one thing about the misconception of getting back to running after childbirth, what would that be? Um, the first and foremost is that there's no date. There's no magic date that is appropriate for everyone. It is just different. And so with that comes grace, I think for, uh, for ourselves as moms, as just, um, understanding that it is a rebuilding process and to enjoy that journey of rebuilding. Sometimes the rebuilding process is more structured and provides with a more solid cornerstone to running than before. If you just kind of entered running on your own without having been coached on running form and some of that, this may be your opportunity to be a better, stronger runner. I'm a better runner having forced myself through those cornerstones of rebuilding post being a mom, I am faster. I am way stronger and way better with my times than I was prior. And so I would say it's, you're not, you're not facing down just being deconditioned or broken or any of that, but it does take time and it is unique to you and it can be amazing. Yeah. So there is, there's hope, right? This isn't like you're in the back end and you can still challenge yourself, do hard things. And, um, there is just, a, a way to go about that. And hopefully, you know, many moms learned about some of those ways to go about that um, after um, pregnancy. And I'm sure, you know, there's going to be a lot that connected with everything you had to say, you know, where is the best place for our Healthy Runner community to connect with you? They can connect on um, Instagram uh, at Intimate Rose and then on our website, intimaterose.com. And then if they have any questions, they can always email myself and my team at support at intimaterose.com. I know that it's um, sometimes hearing this information for the first time can feel shocking. So, so we're always available for everyone and we're here to help. Yeah. And you have some amazing educational videos as well on your Instagram account. So I would recommend everyone go ahead and follow um, Intimate Rose. And Amanda has been gracious enough to give our Healthy Runner community a little discount 
um, at their website with their products. So I will drop that link in the show notes below and you can use code healthy runner, um, to be able to get a discount for any of the products, um, that they offer at intimate Rose. So thank you for that. And, you know, thank you guys, the listeners, um, for tuning into this episode, uh, whether or not you're watching the video version on replay in our healthy runner, Facebook group, or our spark healthy runner, YouTube channel. Um, I appreciate all of you guys, um, for tuning in and Amanda, thank you so much, uh, for coming on, uh, greatly appreciate your time and expertise and sharing with our community. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure. Indeed it has, uh, for me as well. Um, and thank you guys as always, let's remember, let's stay active, let's stay healthy and let's just keep on running until next time.